Bilkab. I, I'm the uh, bookend for Mike's uh, talk at the beginning because I'm interested in class in a somewhat uh, different but um, very tightly connected way. Labor historians have detailed how the structure of the workplace, the cultural aspects of community and spatial patterning impact class consciousness. From coal mining, coal mining sort of the paradigmatic you know, the bosses are on the hill and the workers are in the hollow, uh, to ethnic uh, neighborhoods in Pittsburgh where each of the ethnic groups is on a different hill and uh, works in the steel mills, but the neighborhood taverns, union halls, churches, that socialization matters. It matters to the feeling of class consciousness, the organization. Capital has learned the virtues from its perspective of replacing a single River Rouge-like plant with a number of redundant, smaller facilities located as far from each other as they can get, hopefully workers speaking different languages, living in different countries under different uh, political regimes as a way of dividing the class globally. So it's not without interest that where labor can be tightly controlled, as in Foxconn's plant in Shenzhen, China, they can have hundreds of thousands of workers in the same plant as the Ford model once was in this country. They don't have to divide the working class because they have this tight uh, political control over them. In other parts of the world, the organization becomes different. So long as the reserve army of potential workers is available, inhumane levels of exploitation continue on a global scale. Now, well, in the 1960s, the 1960s, half century ago, was a period where American companies, while they did have international divisions and exported, they were basically U.S. companies. They're now, of course, transnational corporations. And if you look at the most valuable corporations, being an economist, of course, valuable means by stock market capitalization, uh, the most valuable corporations in America are very different than the largest corporations in America today. And if you look at the working class, as I want us to do, class is a dynamic term. It is not a static term. The, ca the class is recomposed, is constantly in flux, and if we don't understand that, we have difficulties understanding uh, what is going on. The growth of the globally, av globally available labor force <coughs> remains a major obstacle to the advancement of working class interests everywhere. I was going to coin a phrase about workers of the world getting together. I haven't quite got the wording. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it is still, of course, a requirement. Understanding the evolution of the working class in the United States, of course, as well as elsewhere, means we have to look at what's happening. The U United Auto Workers, once the most powerful union in America, has lost 80% of its members since 1980. New hires in auto are working at $13, $15 an hour on an assembly line next to workers that are earning twice that under a two-tier contract. Uh, there's a group named BNA. It's a business and legal publisher. They estimate that 20% of U.S. workers in 2010, 20% of all workers, are covered by such two-tier wage and benefit provisions, and that will increase. The old accommodations, as Bill Vlasic uh, writes of two-tier pay, what was once seen as a desperate move to prop up the struggling auto industry is now considered an integral part of its future. And so you have a totally different situation in what was once the most organized part of the working class. There are predictions that 40% of American workers will be self-employed, as it's called. Your UPS guy who delivers your packages is self-employed because what corporations have done is they have reclassified workers so that uh, they are contractors no longer employed by the company directly in the warehouse where your uh, stuff you order online comes. 
those workers are not hired by Amazon. They're hired by 20, 30, 50 uh, subcontractors. While the worker has been working in that uh, wholesale uh, distribution center for 10 years, they may have worked for 20 different subcontractors because Amazon does not want to be the employer, although it controls all of these labor subcontractors. It is a totally different organization of work than we are used to, and we must face that. So thinking about class and politics, we need to look at the difference between the America of the 1960s, where the largest employer going in order, let me just give them to you, was General Motors, the Bell System with its telephone monopoly, Ford, General Electric, that was a General Electric that made things that didn't get most of its profits from finance. Uh, U.S. Steel, now U.S. X. Uh, okay, a half century later, the largest employer in the nation is, of course, Walmart. It is followed by Kelly Services. The Temp People, second largest employer in the country. <laughs> IBM, which is now a business service company, not a computer company. It sold off its computer stuff. UPS, the parcel deliverer. McDonald's and Yum. Y-U-M, exclamation point. You, you know them as Taco Bell, KFC, and Pizza Hut. These are the most valuable corporations in America. Their workplaces are small, dispersed, non-union, almost exclusively. And the number of employees working in the 2010 largest corporations are roughly twice the number as those employed in the industrial giants of 50 years ago. But employment in the former giants was characteristically for life. In today's low-wage, non-union megacorps, worker turnover is substantial, and many are on temporary contracts, although they can go on for quite a while, and are the greatest growth. If we look at where the working class is growing, what occupations, seven of the ten occupations that are expected to see the largest growth, according to the Department of Labor, are low-wage or very low-wage jobs. So we're looking at a future that looks nothing like the labor force, the working class occupational distribution of the post-war period. So we need to take that as our starting point. We're seeing uh, what, has been, what has always been true of the black working class as the most exploited, most oppressed, most discriminated against. We're seeing a growing white underclass of unemployed and low-wage workers especially in rural areas where methamphetamine is uh, the crack of choice and communities destroy um, people uh, living in abject poverty and being ignored uh, so that it is a different kind of country. Uh, breaking down Michael's working class seems to me to be very important. In doing this, and I'll get as far as I get in the talk, and Magalie will cut me off, but I want to start with Marx. Uh, the Marx who, the Marx used class in many, many ways. And uh, for the Marxists in the crowd who think they understand Marx's use of class, after which you can come and explain it to me. <laughs> as I read Marx, the words meaning shifts. It constantly shifts because the relations of the context in which Marx uses the term class constantly shift, and he does not give us warning. The, uh, the books on Marx have it all nicely laid out. Marx didn't do that. The same group can be placed in different taxonomies depending on the question he's asking, the level of social reality he is exploring. As Bertel Ullman, who I think is one of the few people who gets this well, says Marx conflates a number of social ties, relations between groups based on various standards, which are generally treated separately. He views them as interacting parts of an organic whole, the society in question. 
And it is in that use of class, the many ways, if you're looking at the society as a whole, you're asking different questions, you're looking at capitalism as a system, you're looking at the current conjecture, you're looking at different political contexts, you use class very differently. Most popularly, people talk about Marx's use of class as, you know, slaves and masters, serfs and lords, workers and capitalists. But for our purposes here, we want to look at another major use of the term class that we find in Marx, that of class fractions, or as the manifesto put it, the complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank, a manifold gradation of social rank. These ranks become anachronistic as societies evolve. Capitalism as a dynamic system, yeah, uh, I'll just go till my time is up here. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I won't show you that. The consciousness of individuals and groups change, and if you look at uh, probably the most important uh, Marx's writing, if, if this is a question that interests you, is the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, where Marx produces the classic analysis of political struggle, which is of most interest to me uh, here today and in this period, where he correlates the interests of class fractions and political movements contesting for power. It's an analysis in which contingency, personality, opportunism, all figure. And in that canonical work, he delineates the groups opposing the Paris proletariat in 1848. They were the aristocracy of finance, the industrial bourgeoisie, the middle class, the petty bourgeoisie, the army, the lumpen proletariat organized as the mobile guard. Uh, this is right-wing populace, if you're in uh, Fletcher's thinking about it. Um, and the intellectual lights, the clergy, and the rural population. And then discussing their various roles, uh, he builds a political understanding of the 1848 struggle and what the working class was against. For 30 years since Ronald Reagan became president, conservative politicians have done a just really good job, and I, I think that uh, Michael's uh, comments were very helpful in, in that background. A job of misdirecting working class anger towards people they call the liberal elite. The liberal elite has been a powerful enemy besides the other, uh, the Ken Kenyan, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever he is these days. Uh, Richard Nixon's Southern strategy takes place at a time of deindustrialization. It is not just playing on racism as some permanent uh, reality in America, which it is, but in the context of deindustrialization of the industrial Midwest. The election this year will be decided in 13 states, uh, 12 states probably. Half of them are in the industrial Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Wisconsin, and uh, three others going further out. Um, and in those states, the working class will be tempted to vote against Obama because on globalization, the Democrats wedded to international capital were not about to do anything significant to protect the jobs of American industrial workers. So in Minnesota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Michigan, you're going to get some very interesting white working class votes and how they see this, where race is part of it. But the objective reality of the Democrats as the party of transnational capital will play a major part. So we want to look at the working class. We want to look at not just occupations and background, but the culture of areas if <coughs> we want to look at uh, this period. Now, I want to just say a few more things. That the gap between the concerns of the progressive movement and the corporate-run political system come down to where much of the white working class, how they understand what's going on globally, what's going on in their communities, and how they think of class. And it is for that reason that 
we want to look at not just the changes in consciousness that come from where and how people work, who they work with, but the larger global factors that are objectively shifting the reality of working class people. That it is not just the rise of China. It is not just the demographic shifts in the United States where we will uh, in not many decades be a majority minority community where white people will be in a minority of the country as a whole, where Hispanics, blacks, and Asians together will be the majority, where the effort to kill government, to uh, reduce the state and the welfare state, and to return us to the laissez-faire kind of capitalism that you see in this recomposition of the working class and how so many people are being pushed into marginal, marginally paying jobs uh, jobs that are difficult to organize. Now the taking on of public sector unions because there are more public sector union members than private sector union members. And without understanding this in class terms, we cannot build a left. And that was the function of, of our session today. Uh, there's more to say. I'm going to end there. Uh, but hopefully there are a lot of people in this room who have given this stuff a great deal of thought. And I look forward to a great discussion with you all. Thank you.